I have a, I have a presentation uh, that you know we signed up for about why do we play this way? Economics and games. One of my favorite topics to talk about. There are a number of different things that uh, do and discuss. I teach at the University of Wisconsin Stout and uh, over in Menominee, Wisconsin, and I teach a variety of things, but most of my focus is tabletop gaming, getting freshmen that are first coming into the program kind of up to speed on just some of the basics about game design, including prototyping, but also some of the language that's involved and really try to get them prepared for their uh, education trajectory through the game design program. I've got a little bit more about me too. Some people may know me by the games that I have done and others may not. I'm gonna be sharing a screen to the keynote presentation here. So now you should be seeing a why do we play this way picture with little meeple with a question mark above their head. And if somebody could just in the chat type a yes, you got it to make sure that everyone's able to see. All right, thank you, Lex, for the thumbs up. We are good to go. So um, usually this would be a in-person presentation that I would give either to the class or in a lecture hall, be really animated and walking around. So just imagine that you've got this very, very energetic person who's super passionate about gaming, walking around talking to you while you listen to this. But one of the first questions that I usually get is, um, who are you? Why do you get to be a professor of us and teach us? And other people will like bring one of my games on the first day of class and ask me to sign them. It really depends because we get a broad range of students. So for those who don't know me, my name is Jay Little. Uh, I consider myself a tabletop designer and an instructor uh, at the university level. I do both of those. And together, that's pretty much a full-time game design itinerary. I've worked with a number of large publishers in the tabletop industry, including Fantasy Flight Games, now uh, owned by Asmo Day. I've worked with WizKids and their Clicky Games for a while. And I've done some work with Ravensburger, who's probably well known for being one of the largest jigsaw puzzle manufacturers in the world, but they do have a really thriving board game department as well. I've also worked with a lot of big name licenses. So most people know me for my work with Star Wars, but I have done work for other licenses as well. And some of the work that I've designed, like I'll design a system that is then grafted to a number of different licenses. So I did this 2D20 role, role playing system that was used for Fallout and it was used for Dishonored and it was used for Star Trek Adventure. So it actually runs a number of the different licenses that Modiphius has. Um, and other than that, I just love games. I've been a gamer. As long as I can remember, I can still remember my first Dungeons and Dragons experience with my brother as a game master uh, when I was eight years old. But here's a smattering of some of the games that I've done. I've been fortunate to work along with some big names in the industry too. Some of you might be familiar uh, if you are a gamer with the name Eric Lang. He's a very popular and well-known designer and I got to kind of learn at his elbow working on Chaos in the Old World and then I did the expansion for that. I've done expansions for a number of other systems as well. And then I've also gotten to work with uh, other systems that pre-existed. For example, if you've ever played the Unlock series of escape room decks of cards, there were probably 25 to 30 of these decks already and adventures already. So it was kind of a set formula, but they wanted to do a Star Wars implementation. So I helped them take the system that they already had and make sure that it would deliver a Star Wars experience. I've done a lot of other games as well, but these are the ones that most people either recognize on site or will bring up when I go to a convention, for example. I really do split my focus between role-playing games and board games. I am sitting in an office right now where I am surrounded by more than 2,000 role-playing items. So we're talking about supplements, adventures, core books, expansions, and all of those things. But I've got just shelves and shelves and shelves behind me um, of the role playing. And this is the long splash behind me. That is an incredible phone up front, but a number of those games that you'll see in that desk are games that I've designed as well. But more so, I'm known as a tabletop nerd. I founded Geekway to the West, which is a gaming convention held every year in St. Louis, Missouri. And it 
basically started because uh, I really liked games. And I was one of the people fortunate enough in St. Louis to kind of be there at the boom of tabletop gaming. And I've got more games than literally fit in our house right now. Um, we've got one spare bedroom that was completely filled with games instead of actually putting a bed in it. And now that is full and overflowing. So we've got all of these games. And I've been collecting games since I've been 10 or 11 uh, up through now. As a professional, I collect games both for study as well as for play. So that's a little bit about me and hopefully a little bit of game cred for why I would be here talking to you about something. But then what does gaming have to do with economics? I am not an economist. I will just put that out there. But I love reading work done by other economists. And my wife has a master's degree in economics as well. And so we will argue because she obviously knows a lot more about economics than me. I love hearing about these concepts and applying them to both game design as well as game play. One of the first and most obvious questions that people don't even consider to ask sometimes is what is a game? And what do I mean by a game? And one of my favorite answers to this is from Sid Meier, the designer of Civilization that a game is a series of interesting choices. So it's not just one, but it's going to be a series that they're not just passive or somewhat uh, engaging, but that they are interesting to us and that they're not false options, but it really is player choice and agency that is going to drive that experience forward. I take it a step further. And when I'm talking to students, I try to differentiate this between what I would consider activities. And that is the inclusion of meaningful decisions. So for me, Candyland, unfortunately, does not fit a technical definition of what I call a game for my classroom. It's more of an activity because you can passively have something else play Candyland for you. You could have a computer do that uh, or a cat to do that. Anything that provides some sort of random generation for the deck because there are no choices at all during the game. The game can act without you being there. So is that much of a game? No, I would consider that an activity. So we're going to be focusing on games. And what do I mean by economics in this kind of uh, framework then when I'm talking about games? Well, first of all, I think each individual game session is a microcosm or a small miniature economy at scale. And in any sort of economy, you're going to have something that are good supplies, some sort of currency. Well, in gaming, these are the decisions that we make. We have a certain amount of currency that we get to spend over the course of a game session. And that's another reason why this kind of works and functions like an economy. Like an economy, we want to make informed choices. We don't want to just arbitrarily yank something off of the box or look at the rule book and randomly point at something and say, this is what we're going to be doing but we want informed choices. We also want to be able to trust those options. So the information that we're getting is genuine, that we're coming at them from a position of knowledge and that we're going to feel vested in this, that we are making the decisions that are going to drive our uh, victory or defeat, that we're not just sitting in the back seat. And then finally, because I'm arguing that this is an economy, then we should be able to see some of the ideas like supply and demand and other economic principles apply. Some of them obviously apply better than others because we are talking about a very, very small microcosm and a step aside from, for example, our global economy where we're talking about gross domestic product and we're talking about all of these other functions and factors that may influence governments as they make their decisions. So we're going to go through these step by step, starting with the argument that games are microcosms of an economy. And part of that is in an economy, people are doing the best they can to get by while making choices throughout their life. You are constantly bombarded with choices from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, you are making choices all the time sometimes they've become automatic. They're choices that we make so often that they've fallen into a routine and we don't need to think about them anymore. For example, choosing to brush your teeth, that is still a choice, but for many of us, it is just part of a routine. 
So it's not something that would be an interesting choice. So here are some things that you might think of as, wow, these are the sorts of things that make me stop, break from routine and think about this and actually explore and evaluate the decision that I'm about to make. And one of those is how big a splash is this going to be? How significant is this choice to what I'm going to refer to as the game state? And that's basically if you took a snapshot of a game or an economy or any other system at a given moment in time, if you took a Polaroid picture of it, would it look the same after this decision as the Polaroid that you just took? How impactful, how large a splash? Another thing that makes choices a lot uh, more interesting for us is the amount of drama that we can infuse into the situation. This is especially true of role-playing games where you can think of things that might really disrupt the game master's plans. For example, you're having an audience with the king and somebody decides, I'm gonna throw an apple at him. Okay, that could certainly disrupt things and have things go in a different direction than we thought. Another one is if we have not fully considered the consequences or if the consequences are going to have a very large effect on us and then ROI is return on investment. It's kind of tied to consequences too. What am I going to see in the future? What are going to be some of the echoes that this choice has? And then another thing that makes one choice interesting is when we have to make it and forsake other choices and that's called an opportunity cost. So if I want to both go see a movie at noon on Sunday, but I have a friend who wants to play Dungeons and Dragons on noon on Sunday, but I also have my kids who want to go to the park at noon on Sunday, well, I can pick one of those things, but I can't pick all of them. That's going to make that choice meaningful and impactful as well. And this is true not just for life, but I think I didn't even say game with each of those different bullet points. But I think you can see how those decisions would impact a lot of game making choices as well. We can also think about this as other ways that we evaluate regular day to day choices. We constantly think about our self benefit, but sometimes we will also think about how this affects other people. For example, driving when it's crowded and very, very busy during rush hour. Are we going to go 10, 15 miles over the speed limit? Are we going to be using our blinkers? Are we gonna let that person merge from the right? Uh, and so a lot of these things, again, some of these we do automatically and we don't actually have to do much consideration and others, these will really be a moment for us to pause and reconsider our position. The greater point being that a lot of these same evaluations and considerations that make our life choices meaningful, impactful, and interesting on a smaller scale, because a game is just one session and not one lifespan, these things apply to what we do during a game as well. So that this means it's valuable to us, not only as a player to understand these choices, what makes them interesting and why we might engage with them, but as a designer, if we want people to be engaged with our game, we must make it as interesting as possible. And one way to do that is to relate to the things they already know, such as their day-to-day -day lives. In fact, often you might find yourself in a situation where it feels like the same position, but you would make different decisions with that, such as that rush hour example. Well, being stuck in rush hour might feel like the same position if you are still 10 miles away from your destination, but you might make very, very different decisions based on all of the circumstances surrounding any one instance. So this is important because each one of your commutes during rush hour is an individual session, just like one play of a game would be a session. That's another snapshot or microcosm. So how threatening is our current situation? How desperate are we? Do I need to get there by five o'clock or else I'm fired? What's happening in game versus the metagame? A good example for that would be with board games again. Am I making the decision because my friend Morgan is the biggest threat at the table or am I making this decision because my friend Morgan did not pony up and put in their fair share for pizza? Both of those things can impact and influence the decision-making process. So if we've got all of these decisions at our fingertips, and hopefully, again, they're meaningful and interesting decisions, then each individual decision is a unit of currency. 
at the beginning of the game, we may or may not know how much is in our billfold. For example, some games will last a very, very specific number of rounds. Each round has a very specific number of actions. So if our game lasts 25 rounds and every round you get two actions, we've got $50 in our wallet to be able to make our game decisions with. So we need to evaluate decisions and decide how much of the $50 am I willing to invest in this one choice. The reason that's important to consider is we've always got this fake money with us that has some sort of value applied to the game, and we're always playing for stakes. And a stake is anything that gets us invested mentally, emotionally in a situation. So we play for stakes all of the time. Fortunately, some of these are very objective and explicit because we are playing for uh, money. Others are subjective and implied, for example, growing friendship or perhaps the opportunity to make or lose a friend. But we are always playing for stakes. Part of the issue is can we correctly identify what those stakes are and how much those stakes are going to cost me? And there are three particular stakes that I like to talk about. And the first one is a very broad and general category called bennies. The second type of currency that we use in gaming is social and then the last type of currency that we may use solely or as another layer on top of these others would obviously be something monetary when we've got money riding on the outcome of a circumstance so as we take a look at these different types of stakes and the different costs involved there are a few things to think about in the back of your mind and as we look at these three different types of currency, I've got these questions re-asked on each of those slides because I think the questions have slightly different answers based on the type of currency that we're being asked to spend over the course of this game. What is it that we are actually playing for? Have we, correct, <clears throat> have we correctly identified it as a player? And what do we risk with each decision that we make, both in gains and losses with that currency, but also gains and losses with other things in the game state. Sometimes it's important to know, like a stock portfolio, whether aggressiveness can be an attribute that is positive or negative. And then what is it that we really care about here? Where are we putting the majority of our emotional focus? If it's in the money part, that's different than if it's in the social so let's take a look at Benny's. Benny's is something that I particularly see a lot in, for example, handheld phone games that have daily prizes that you can go back for. And as long as you check in for the day, you're going to get your bonus carrots or your bonus diamonds or energy or whatever that particular game might use to entice you to come back. It's a small benefit. It's not going to completely upset the apple cart and give you an unrecoverable advantage over other people. We see this a lot of times in role-playing games as well. Why it might be overt. One of my favorite games, Hollow Earth Expeditions, actually has a Benny where if you do something well in the game, you do something that is very in character. You make uh, people laugh. You do something witty, things like that. You're going to get a token that is put in front of you that you can spend later in exchange for a bonus to a task. So it will help you a little bit later on in the game, but that might not be why you did it in the first place. You did it because it felt right in the moment or it was part of the pattern that you had established with your character and your traits. So if the only thing that is at stake are bennies, we might be willing to play a lot more fast and loose with the rules, shoot from our hip and not fully evaluate things, maybe play in a little bit more of a rush mode so we can get as much gaming into a compressed period of time as possible. But bennies are also one of these things that might be layered on another type of currency because you could play a game of poker, for example, and not only do you have your chips representing actual money, but there might be bennies in it as well if this is really a more social game where you're getting together with your group every Saturday night and playing 20 buck poker. And so there's a lot going on in addition to just the money. I think social currency is one of the currencies that is most easily overlooked during a game. 
because building up social currency takes time. It usually takes a lot longer to build social currency than it does to spend or sometimes burn social currency. So you're going to be building this currency, earning this currency through behaviors. So whether it's just being nice to other people, whether it is helping them out, whether it's forming an alliance during the game, it's going to be mutually beneficial. All of these things, all of our interactions with other people, how we choose to behave is going to affect how much social currency we then have to spend with those people. So if my friend Alex and I have had years and years of a relationship and have been friends for a long time and have been gaming for a long time, then I would feel more comfortable going to Alex and asking for a favor than I might with Pat, who I've only known for a few weeks. And I'm not really sure exactly what level of rapport we have established with each other. So some games deliberately use social currency. A game like Apples to Apples, for example, is a judgment-based game. So our behaviors in there can influence the outcome. Not only did we make a funny joke or situation with that, uh, Cards Against Humanity, also the same model as Apples to Apples, but we might influence the judge and who they award victory to based on social currency. It's a bit of a nudge. It's a bit of a week. It's a bit of a favor to get that ruling from the judge in those situations. Then the root of all evil, we have something that has real world value. And what I think is especially important for both designers and players to understand is, in my experience, as soon as you add monetary currency, monetary rewards or losses to a system, you suddenly have a much more tense, anxious and cautious system. Players are going to tend on average to play more conservatively because they do not want to lose something that has a more significant intrinsic value to them. Yes, you're still gonna have your reckless aggressive players, but more often people might curb those tendencies to play more conservatively once we know that there's gonna be an IOU on the line. Whoever loses this game has to do dishes for a week. That might be a large enough, that has real world value. It might not be cha-ching cash in your pocket, but that sort of thing has far more of a real world value than social currency in my belief. So that would be another example. But as soon as you add any sort of prize or money, such as a cash payout, very, very different situation. And I think poker might be the best example for that. If you're playing just for chips and for bragging rights, the social currency, you might have a different type of table talk. You might let certain faux pas uh, occur and pass at the table than you would if there is cold, hard cash on the line. Because if we're playing for money, then we better play right. We're going to play all by the rules. I expect people to keep their hands nice and tidy. I don't want people to be playing sloppy. I want things in a certain way. We have certain expectations when money is involved than otherwise. So we evaluate options differently depending on which of these or which combination of these currencies are involved, Benny's social or monetary currency. So if we evaluate things differently, whenever there's something at stake, and I started this off by saying that there's always something at stake, always. Otherwise, why should we play in the first place? If we don't have some sort of investment in that experience, then we are not going to engage with that experience. So since there's always something at stake, we need to always be careful. That means we need to consider and evaluate these decisions, whether we are the player performing these decisions as we try to win the game, or if we are the designer who is trying to integrate these decisions so that people enjoy the experience. It is a lot more rewarding as a game designer when you see people having fun playing your game rather than having frowns playing your games. So then we move on to, well, if I'm gonna be making these decisions and we do have things at stake, well, then I wanna make an informed choice. I wanna know not only what my choices are, but all the different factors that are going to influence and affect those choices. I want to be an informed consumer. 
So having informed choices is incredibly important, but in order to have informed choices, we need to consider exactly the type of choices or information we're looking for. We might be comparing two different things in a game, whether it's two actions, attack Alex to my left or attack Morgan to my right, or who am I going to make a trade with or who am I gonna form an alliance with, or some other sort of evaluation. What is the relative value of brick in this game versus wood? Sometimes we're just making an estimation. Boy, that's a big pile of chips in front of them, but they are not required to actually show me everything. I am going to, to best of my knowledge, make some assumptions uh, and try to estimate the value that they have. This is often sometimes something that we do if we see more and more information eliminating other options. So in poker, for example, Texas Hold'em, as we see more cards revealed from the deck in the center of the table, we are getting more information. So that coupled with how we see people behaving as they bet, then we're gonna make some sort of estimation. It's still subjective. It might be based on odds, but it's ultimately we're gonna be making some sort of decision based on uh, a gut or instinctual level. So we're making some sort of estimation. Then there are just the really easy ones. If I perform action A, I am going to get 10 points. If I perform action B, I'm going to get 20 points. This game is a race to 100 points. This is very, very easy for me to do. And everybody would arrive at the same outcome. So if everybody is being fed the same facts and an objective calculation, then everybody should be arriving at the same uh, answer. And we make a lot of these automatically. One that is a little bit more difficult to do and takes some skill and time to hone is the information that we glean through heuristics. And I've been teaching for eight or nine years now, and I've probably only had a handful of students over the course of my entire teaching career who've actually heard the term heuristics as it's applied in gaming before. So let's go into a little bit more detail here because heuristics, I think, are one of the key elements that make a game engaging and make the individual choices engaging. Heuristics, in general, is your personal database of knowledge. What's great about this is we are constantly adding information to our database. And there are a number of different ways that we add this information. We can add it from direct experience by playing the game. We can add it through observational experience. I'm watching my friends play the game. We might be able to do that by uh, researching the game. If you want to get better at chess, for example, and you want to put more database information in there, then you can read books on chess. You can study the great games that have taken place over the years. But these are things that we slowly build up over time and that chip away over the uncertainty that we find in games as well. So the stronger our experience is and the more information we have in our database, the more likely we are able to rely on that instinctively and make good decisions, evaluations, estimations, and things like that. But there are two different types of heuristics, and it's important to understand the distinction between these, because there are two different views or two different ways that you can point your camera when you are taking a snapshot of the game. So the first type of heuristics, positional heuristics, is a snapshot from top down. It is the bird's eye view of the game. If I am going to evaluate the game as it is right now, what is it that I'm going to look at? What is it that I'm going to add to my calculation to determine how well I'm doing? I need to have a good understanding of my current position to be able to make any sort of decision that is going to be a camera shot forward, looking ahead. What do I need to do based on where I am now? What do I need to do to improve my position or my chances for winning? And these go hand in hand. We cannot make good directional decisions if we do not have good positional information. And positional information is useless if we do not apply it to the choices that we have at our fingertips moving forward. And different games ask us to evaluate different things. For example, think about some of your favorite games, whether they're tabletop games, video games, role-playing games. 
there are different pieces of information that different games have to give you an idea or that snapshot in a game like Monopoly, three or four rounds into the game, part of the positional heuristics is how much money do I have in front of me? What properties do I have in front of me? Which space on the board is my piece? Have I landed on community chest uh, and have, or chance and have a card, something that might affect or influence things in the future? Would this be my third die roll? Which means that it carries the risk of going to jail. So there are different pieces of information we can look at in order to be able to make choices going forward. Ah, but in order to make choices going forward, one of the things that I didn't mention is that this is all relative to other people. If I tell you, you've got $500, okay, is that good or bad? Well, if $500 is the victory condition, then that's great. If $5 million is the victory condition, $500 might not seem so awesome. But it's also dependent on, again, I'm gonna be using Alex and Morgan a lot. If I've got $200 and I have two of the uh, green properties, well, how many properties does Alex have and how much money does Alex have? Oh, Morgan has that third green property. What might I leverage that would be in Morgan's interest? So I need to understand how well the other players are doing in the game to some degree in order for me to fully understand my current position. It's not just how many victory points you have. There's far more to it than that. Another board game that I use in class a lot is a game called Carcassonne. It is a tile placement game of the beautiful French countryside and each tile can be played and rotated in a number of different ways as long as it connects puzzle style to the other pieces on the board. Well, to understand how well I'm doing, there is a victory point track. So there is a track that will have a little meeple on it that shows me that I've got 30 points and it will also have everybody else's piece on there so I can see how many points I have relative to them. But Carcassonne has a lot of deceptively dense information packed into this ever expanding and growing board because you might have some of your meeples, some of your pieces on the board and depending on where they are placed, they might score points in different ways. If you have one on the squiggly little roads, then it's a thief and the longer the road is, the more points you are going to earn once that road is completed. If you place them in the green pasture, then it's a farmer and it's only gonna score at the end of the game, but it's gonna score based on all the different connected green pieces. And there could only be one farmer in each field. Ah, but as this countryside unfolds and grows, then two farms that had been disconnected, I might have to look at and evaluate and go, if this particular type of tile comes up and Alex places it, Alex would now have the majority in that farm and Alex would score the points instead of me. Or based on this tile that I've drawn, I know that I can knock Morgan out of that city by placing it this way. Or I can finally score points with my thief by finishing off a road that way. So again, we need to understand all the different things that go into the composite of your current game state. How well are you doing? There's a lot of information that goes in there. And again, once we have that information and we evaluate that and go through all the different steps in the process, then we can make good directional decisions based on those heuristics that we've applied. We want to be able to trust these options. That's another important thing about having a stable, and working economy is people need to have confidence in the system. The stock market doesn't work if people don't have confidence in it. No, the whole idea of currency doesn't work if people don't have confidence that the dollar is worth a certain amount. Well, it's a piece of paper. So we're just taking somebody's word that it's going to work in this objective way that we've all agreed upon, even though it's a subjective connection between this piece of paper and this gold sitting somewhere. So if we wanna have a lot of confidence, that's directly opposed by 
risk. And the amount of risk that we are willing to take in order to achieve our goals can heavily influence the outcome. Uh, you may have played, for example, an online sim like Civilization and tried very, very risky opening moves where you try to expand as quickly as you can, as fast as you can, and it works out great because you're able to gather the resources and build new cities in key locations. And in other times, that high risk strategy might backfire because you've spread yourself out so thin that a civilization that you didn't even notice is able to come in and defeat your sparsely guarded home territory. So risk is kind of the counterbalance to confidence. And I think it's important to understand risk better in order to become more confident. And I really like what Eric J. McNulty has developed with his four R's of high risk behaviors and influences. And the four R's that he posits are regret, repeal, repercussions, and resilience. And we look at each of these in the next few slides. So the first type of risk that we have to assess is regret. And that is what are we going to second guess ourselves? What are we going to regret if you fail to act? If you were wrong about a decision? Oh, I did not invest in that railroad. Or after the game is over, oh, I know I could have won if I would have made a different decision at a different time, if I would have allied with a different person, if I would not have been as aggressive and tried to expand so quickly. So how much will you regret a lost opportunity to act? And McNulty posits then that the more serious the opportunity for regret or the more um, we would regret the outcome of not acting, then we need to more strongly consider that and balance that against what we might want to do conservatively. You might really be a conservative person by nature or just with a new group of people and you're not sure about their tendencies. So you have to make this evaluation. Well, how much are you going to kick yourself the next morning if you don't do this, if you don't make this move? Uh, this is a lot of armchair quarterbacking if you're a big sports fan wondering, oh, why did they pull their pitcher in the sixth inning? Oh, why didn't they run on third and one? Whatever it might be where you're trying to second guess what somebody else has done. Well, a lot of those high risk determinations are influenced by regret. The second R of risk is repeal or reverse. If I do make this decision, one of the ways that we can evaluate how risky it is, is how hard is it gonna be for me to make up ground, for me to recover from this decision if it does not work out the way I thought it would. If my alliance with Alex ends up crumbling because Alex betrayed me. If my investment in wool go south because nobody else needs wool for their goods. So the demand for wool drops. I've got all the supply, but nobody wants to buy it. So how easy or how difficult will it be to reverse the outcome of this particular decision? The easier it is to repeal, then the easier it is to make those decisions more lightly or earlier on. If it is going to be extremely difficult to repeal, then usually that's something that you have to decide very early on. So if it does not work the way you want, you have the rest of the game session to be able to recover, or you want to make it very late in the game if you are not currently winning, because it's one of those last ditch efforts, you might need some grand gesture in order to be able to uh, win. And at that point, you're not thinking long-term enough that you would ever be able to come back from this choice because the game's not going to last long. All right, there are only a few turns left in the game. I'm in last place. Yes, in a normal game situation, I might not make this call at the beginning, but if I don't do something now and do something big, Morgan's going to end up winning. The next R is appreciating the repercussions. 
And these aren't always easy to predict. How are the dominoes going to fall? If my decision is a rock, how big is the wave? Where are the splashes going if I throw this in the middle of the lake? So what are all the different things that are affected by my decision? It's not just my score. If I'm taking a position to look at them and trying to understand how well I'm doing in the game, I have to consider that everybody else in the game is also doing that same thing. They're looking at all the same information I am, but they are evaluating it through their lens. How well am I doing compared to Jay and Alex is what Morgan is thinking. And Alex is thinking, how well am I doing compared to Morgan and Jay? So what is affected? Not only your position, not only your resources or standing, but what else is it going to do? Is it going to impact a marketplace? Is it going to impact somebody's uh, willingness to work with you going forward? Is it going to impact your stakes in the game? For example, um, what are my repercussions in poker of betting everything that I have left of going all in? Well, I have to consider the repercussion of if I don't hold the best hand, I'm out of the game. And if this was a tournament structure, then I'm completely out. Then the money that I invested in that for a seat at the tournament is lost and gone, and I've got to wait for another opportunity. So can I look at where all the different ripples are going to occur and how large they are going to expand? This can also be thought of as the difference between tactical and strategic thinking. Tactical is often considered to be more short-term immediate, short-term action, short-term reward, versus a longer strategy where these long-term combination of actions will hopefully result in this long-term benefit to you. I am not good at making those long-term plans. So for me, I usually have to look at more immediate repercussions. And I just try to go by gut on what those ripples are going to be four turns from now, eight turns from now, by the end of the game. So for me, that's a high risk part of my evaluation. The last one is resilience. And this one's a little bit different than the others because it's looking at risk through the lens of how thick of armor do I have? How um, tough is everybody else's skin around me? What, what is my resilience? In game, your resilience might be, all right, if I am going to be risking money, my resilience might be the amount of money that I have. I might be risking $1,000. And if I only have 1,000, I'm not very resilient against that outcome if my decision does not work properly. However, if I've got $10,000, then risking $1,000, I've got some resilience to that. I can absorb that risk. Whether or not it works out for me, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be able to still make important decisions later on that will drive me forward in the game. So you can think about it through not only your resilience, but am I scraping away at other people's resilience? Because one of the ways that you can win a fight is by slowly wearing down your opponents. Boxing, um, jiu-jitsu, any sort of Martial combat does this. Heck, wrestling, three minutes of wrestling is completely exhausting. So if you don't have high endurance, if you're not resilient against the decisions your opponent is making in a very literal sense, then you're going to be losing and those risks that you're taking are going to be evaluated differently. And then finally, this idea of economies have different laws. And the law that most people are familiar with is the law of supply and demand. As supply goes up, demand goes down. If demand goes up, um, or as supply goes down, demand goes up. The, the more there is of something, like right now, I have been trying to get my Xbox Series for five years, but the supply is so low and the demand is so high that I'm not quite willing to fork over $1,000 yet, twice the retail value for that. Now, at some point, if the supply continues to be small, then my demand for that product might be so great that I'm willing to pay the higher cost. Well, the same thing with decision making. We have these same sorts of thoughts. They are just applied in a different context. 
So in this case, I look to uh, economist Dan O'Reilly, who has a number of fantastic books. My favorite one is Predictably Irrational, which is basically a look at how stupid people become in the face of certain situations influenced. For example, one of his is if you make something free, people go absolutely crazy and stop acting rationally at all because they fail to separate free from some sort of value. Well, if it's free, it must be great. Well, not always. Sometimes free is more of a burden. But anyway, talking about the basics of economy, most economists, I think, would agree that in order to apply these economic models, in order for us to try to forecast anything, we've got to feed information into the system. We've got to, we need data for a calculation. Well, all of that is well and good, but we actually need two underlying things to be true in order for any of that to matter. First, we need people within this economy to act rationally. They need to be making logic, information-based choices. They need those informed decisions. So first, people are acting rationally. The second pillar that we need to help uphold this economy is that we all understand and can have confidence in the fact that people are acting in their best self-interest, that they are acting to better themselves, to advance their own causes, needs, and wants. So these are great because we can generally see, especially if the stakes are money or other real in-world things that have a uh, very, very significant value, we tend to see people act rationally and we tend to see people act in their best self-interest. Now, we might not understand their situation fully, so it may not appear that it's rational or self-interest, but they it's like how nobody ever sees that they're the villain in something. Everybody thinks that they're working from the right position or the right perspective. We just need to understand and accept that people are acting rationally and acting in their best self-interest. Well, that sounds great when we're looking at an enormous sample size of billions of people on planet Earth, or even just hundreds of millions of people in North America. You're going to have outliers where you have people that are not acting rationally and are not acting in their best self-interest. But we know that there's a large enough number of these people who are that we can start to make some calculated informed choices. Oh, there's one huge problem. Gamers are among the most irrational people that I have ever come across. Gamers make decisions for ridiculous and sometimes idiotic reasons. Sometimes those are unintentional, but what really gets me is sometimes they make these truly idiotic moves on purpose. People aren't rational 100% of the time. Gamers aren't rational a lot of the time. And I'd argue that sometimes online gamers in a tense situation or experienced gamers with brand new gamers, there are gonna be a lot of irrational decisions. Now, whether it's a video game, board game, or role-playing game, most of you can probably draw on experience and think of some examples where players have made decisions based on completely different set of guidelines than you would. The first one, I think, completely makes sense. If I am teaching a game to somebody for the first time, I'm going to be playing very, very differently. That is not in my best self-interest, strategically in the game in order for me to win, I might be showing you options that are available to you that really don't earn me a lot of points or put me in a better position, but I wanna make sure that you understand the game fully so that you're making informed decisions and I've got a good opponent that I can play against. The very first time you learn a game. So I get what's called option overload. If you start to tell me that I could do more than five, six, seven, eight things on my turn, if you give me a menu of 15 different actions that I can perform, that's going to be like, ah, too much, too much. Sensory overload. I cannot go through all of that. So 
when I'm testing out strategies or first learning a game, I might trim my decision tree down to, I'm only gonna focus on trying these three different options right now. If there are five ways to score points, I might only look at three of them and say, you know what, I'm only gonna try to build new buildings uh, develop alliances and trade goods. I'm not going to worry about developing my technology tree or conquering land yet. So I'm only going to focus on a smaller set of the larger rules. Those are still rational from that perspective, but they're not necessarily in your own best self-interest. Sometimes people will make decisions just to play the devil's advocate and to see if the outcome would truly be as dire as they first think. And sometimes that's one of the best ways to get more information for your personal heuristic database is by playing opposite of what you might normally do. By thinking, you know what, usually I'd play it safe here and draft gold, or usually I'd play it safe here and go for the center lane or go after their DPS or tank or whatever it might be. But this time, what if we do go into a match and decide to all play uh, buff support characters, or if we're super aggressive, or what happens if nobody ends up taking the lead and nobody's assertive and aggressive in the game? Can the game actually move forward if nobody fires the first shot and initiates conflict? But those last three are among the least rational reasons why people make decisions, but are also among the most easily remembered instances, perhaps from our own gaming experience. Oh my gosh, this game is taking so much longer than I expected. I just want it to be over. I don't even care if I win at this point anymore. So I want to take my turns as quickly as possible. I am not going to be the reason that this game took three hours to complete. Spite and revenge. Sometimes this is all based on things that take place outside the game. Now, sure, inside the game, Alex may have run me over in the first half, but now that I've been able to rebuild myself and now I've got better uh, technology than they are, well, I'm going to go after Alex and grind them down a little bit out of revenge. But you know what? It can be completely out of game. Something that happened during our day may influence our decision making in our game session. So if we had a lousy day and got caught in the rain on our way over to our friend's house, just the fact that we are upset by that, we might do that. If, um, you know, again, that whole idea, I've seen this before in role-playing groups where people don't pitch in for soda, pizza, or whatever it might be. There's that one friend who just always shows up late. Whatever that stigma or uh, incompatibility might be, that might be enough to trigger a different type of decision-making behavior in somebody else to prove a point to be able to admonish that person. And sometimes you just wanna kick things over and see what spills out. The anarchist, where you cannot predict their moves in any way, shape whatsoever, they're making completely random moves or things that seem irrational. Again, I mean, looking off of this, you could probably think of situations that would apply to a number of games that you particularly enjoy or have observed before. And darn it, players just don't always act rationally and they don't always act in their own self-interest. So if those two pillars are essential to a solid economy to which we can apply our economic models, then gaming seems really incompatible. But it's just a weird enough combination of these things that you can organize this chaos in a certain way and still apply some of these traits, truisms, and axioms and get some reliable return on those investments. So speaking of chaos, one of the reasons why it can be so difficult to make decisions in games is we're not sure how to measure a decision. Now, if we have a brick we can take a ruler like this and we can measure it. And I can measure it with that ruler and Morgan can measure it with that ruler and Alex can measure it with that ruler. And we will all come up with the same outcome. We will all come up with the same value. That brick is six inches by four inches by two inches. 
there is an absolute objective way of measuring this that we can all look at, verify, and agree with. And we have this for weights, we have this for distances, we have this for time. We have these absolute objective forms of measurement for so many things in our lives that sometimes we can be caught a little unexpected or flat-footed when it comes to measuring something that is suddenly subjective. How valuable is it to get three bricks instead of two? How valuable is it for me to upsize my value meter? How valuable is it for me to have a backup deodorant in the pantry? Whatever it might be. Suddenly, when we're talking about something that is not measured in an absolute or objective way, how do we compare it to someone else's evaluation of that same item? Well, in economics, that unit of measurement, instead of inches or seconds or cubic liters, it is a util, short for utility. How much utility do we get out of that particular item, object, or in this case, decision? So the good thing is now we have a unit of measurement. The tough thing is it's relative. So an inch is suddenly some variable point on that ruler, or when I measure an inch, I come to a different outcome than when Alex or Morgan measure what an inch is. So a util may be slightly different to each person based on the information they have in their database, what they're operating with, how much confidence they have in the system, and whether they feel that they can trust these economic principles that apply in a game. So comparing value versus utility. Sometimes like cost and price aren't necessarily the same thing. Some people can get hung up over value versus utility. And sometimes value is just the physical discrete values of an item. So I can take a bottle of water and I can measure it. I can measure it in individual units. I only need to worry about bottles of water and I have one. I can measure it in volume. I've got 12 fluid ounces here. Um, you can measure it in its chemical composition. You can measure it in its height. You can measure it in its weight. There are a number of different ways that we can objectively, consistently measure a bottle of water. But how much utility does a bottle of water have? How valuable is that bottle of water to Alex versus me? How fiercely should I bid on that bottle of water when I'm bidding against Morgan for that one bottle of water. So a lot of this, being able to understand utility means we have to adjust our thinking about, quant instead of quantifiable, it's a qualifiable. It's, it's a subjective measurement. Because if we're out in the Mojave Desert, we've been stranded out there, then one bottle of water is going to have a huge amount of value and we would likely make choices and decisions that are higher risk in order for us to get that bottle of water. We would be willing to risk greater stakes, whether they are social stakes, whether they are monetary stakes, in order to acquire that bottle of water. However, if we work in the plant where that bottle of water was put together, then we probably have easy, simple access to water, or just if we live in a country or a location where you turn on the tap and there you've got clean potable drinking water versus living in some sun scorched area that doesn't even have access to local wells. Well, that bottle of water can have dramatically different value. It would have a different number of utils based on that individual person's current situation. And that value might change over time for the same person. Today, I'm thirsty. Tomorrow, I'm not. So that's going to have a very different impact on your evaluation on how many utils or how many units of value a particular item or choice has. So game decisions are interesting because game decisions are these weird, tiny, whiny balls of chaos that aren't always easy to measure. Even though we might have some objective measurements, there are a lot of subjective elements to it. So it can have a static value, but a dynamic utility. 
And what do I mean by that? Well, playing a certain card from your hand, whether it's poker or Magic the Gathering, playing the right card at the wrong time, well, if it has the impact to do something differently on turn one than turn two, or if it would leave you more exposed, then it has a static value. It's still the ace of spades, but it has dynamic utility. Boy, it's really going to be different if I play it now than if I play it later. The way you spend your actions on your turn. Am I spending them to raise armies? Am I spending them to build cities? Am I spending them to conquer enemies? Even just how we move around a board. Um, or in any sort of driving game, how we want to maneuver through space. One of my favorite uh, board games to simulate driving is Formula Day. You got these really, really nice racetracks that you're moving your little car models around. And how you move through the board is incredibly important because the amount that you move makes a big difference depending on whether you are on an inside track or an outside track in that game. The closer you are to the inside of a curve, if you're going too fast, then you might um, become unwieldy and take damage to your car or spin out or lose control or whatever it might be. But anytime we're doing a thing for a result, even if we're doing the same thing for the same result, I am going to draft this card for five victory points. That might sound like the same thing all the time. And while it is measurable in that way, its utility to us. Yes, drafting this thing for five points might be great at the beginning of the game, but later on, once we've unlocked and built up a mechanism that allows us to earn even more points with a single action, in a lot of games, there's this idea of for every action I perform, I expect to get an action and a half of value out of it. Or for every dollar I invest, I want to get a dollar fifty back. So trying to think of Overall, I want to get a little bit more out of the system than what I put into the system. So a good example of static value but dynamic utility is Uno, one of the simplest card games ever created. And this is the reverse card for Uno, which simply reverses the play order from going clockwise to counterclockwise. It will always change the play order from clockwise to counterclockwise or counterclockwise to clockwise. That's its purpose. That's what it does. This one happens to be green, but if we removed the color from it and just looked at it as its ability to rotate turn order, it's always going to rotate turn order. But doing that at the beginning of the game or the end of the game can make a big difference. If Alex is to my left and only has one card left, and it would go to Alex after my turn, then suddenly that seems to have a great deal of utility because I want to make it harder for Alex to be able to go out and play their last card and win the game. So even it's something as simple as this, it's got you know, one rule, it changes direction. Even that can have dynamic utility based on the situation and where we find ourselves. And the, the static value, but dynamic utility could be based on a number of different factors. So often the decision-making that we make at the beginning of the game is very different than we make at the end of the game. And that might not just be by how far away we are from the victory objective, but it might also be that often in the games, you start out with far fewer resources or options than you have as you build up a civilization or you build up um, your engine over the course of the game, you suddenly have more options or each action that you take is going to reward you even more. Boy, we have a lot of different decision-making consequences based on the player count. This is why it's so hard as a game designer to design blindly without a lot of playtesting at different player numbers. So if I design a game that plays great with four, I can't just assume that it plays great with three or great with five. In fact, most board game designers, I think, would agree that designing for three people is probably the hardest number of people to design for because benefiting, it's, it's zero sum. Every time I benefit Alex, I am not giving that benefit to Morgan. There's always going to be that imbalance. This kingmaker situation often occurs in a three-player game where one person is choosing the fate of two other people 
uh, where they can't actually win themselves, they have to determine the victory. So player count, huge difference. Video games too. I love Diablo. I've played all of the Diablos. And Diablo 3, that's fun playing by yourself. You can enjoy that as a solo experience. But wow, couch co-op with four people and all the craziness that happens there, you're making different decisions, both on how aggressive you're going to be, where you're going to go, how difficult you're going to play on. Also, some of the limitations. For example, in couch co-op, everybody is limited to being on the same screen at the same time. If we're all playing on different computers and we're hooked up over a network, then we can explore all of the map that we want to. But if we're stuck on the same couch, then we're stuck on the same screen as well. How long the game plays. So if this is a 30 minute game, I'm going to put less sense of investment in those decisions than if it is a three hour game. All right, so talked about a lot of things there uh, regarding the different ways that we take a look at games or what I argue through these games from the economic point of view. There are a few other concepts that I brought in from some of my other presentations that I do think apply very, very well here, but didn't fit neatly into one of those other five categories. So since we've still got time on the clock and I will leave plenty of time for questions, then I just wanna go over a few other thoughts that I think dovetail nicely with this. And the first is basic probability and mathematics. You do not have to be a fantastic mathematician to be a good game designer. I aren't great at math, but I have friends who are, and I understand the basic probability of a bell curve and standard deviations. I understand that in a large enough sample size, if I've got enough play tests under my belt, if I'm rolling the dice, tens of thousands of times, instead of only looking at a single die roll, then I'm going to get some sort of curve of results that I can look at and determine as a game designer, if I'm happy with where most of the action is happening, where that dark blue and medium blue is happening. So the first two standard deviations left and right of your average is gonna be about 68% of your results. Uh, so I'm sorry, the first, deviation left and right. So your two standard deviations are about 68% of your results. So about two thirds. And then you go out and it's even greater and the further out and further out. One mistake that I see a lot of game designers make is ignoring these outcomes because look how small a percentage they make of the overall picture. So why as a designer should I waste brain space on these extremes on these outliers. Well, you have to understand that again, we're looking at an enormous sample size. And in an enormous sample size, if the possibility exists for something to happen, it's going to happen. Now, your play testing might not be a large enough sample size for you to have seen everything or seen it more than once. But once it is released to the wild and it is now being consumed by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of players and millions of sessions, suddenly you're going to get all of those wonky events happening more and more often. So I designed Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 3rd Edition, and it used a bunch of crazy dice that had symbols and colors instead of numbers on them. And I also wanted to create like this really sense of high risk, high reward in here. So there are these purple dice that are difficulty dice, and it's got this one symbol on it, this chaos star, which means a critical failure has occurred. What's the worst thing that could happen in this situation? Well, it just happened. And the more of those dice that you roll, the greater the chance for you of generating more than one star. But I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make a really difficult fire wizard spell. It's going to be a difficulty of four. So they're going to have to roll four of these purple dice. And one of these eight sides on the purple die is a critical failure. And wouldn't it be funny if I said that the result of rolling all four critical failures is that you blow yourself up casting this fire spell? Ha ha, I thought I was being so clever. Aren't I funny? Because there's only a one in 4,096 chance of that even happening very, very small statistically of that even occurring. Well, 
lo and behold, the game is released. And it's not too long till I see this really interesting post on the forum. Boy, you guys should have seen our session last night. And that's because the players were facing a whole bunch of orcs and the fire wizard had just learned a new spell. And so it said, you know, everybody stand back. I got this and rolls those four difficulty dice. And suddenly the standing next to a pile of ashes as he immolated trying to cast that spell. And once I saw that post, I laughed. I thought it was funny, but I also took a very valuable lesson from that. And that is, remember, if it can happen, it will happen. And another reason as game designers, you give brain space to those outliers is those are the memorable stories that people are going to share. They almost always share the extremely good or the extremely bad sessions. Nobody ever shares the story of the average game of risk where I rolled an average amount of time and I won an average amount of conflicts and I won an average game length. No, you talk about the one where you were able to fend off attackers uh, and hold Australia with only one army because people could not roll above what you had and you were just able to you know, hold that with the minimum number of forces. Those are the sorts of weird stories that we share. In fact, a lot of the stories that you might share with others about gaming probably aren't games that went off without a hitch. It's those hitches that often make it more interesting. Another important thing to consider, and this isn't a direct economic principle, is diminishing marginal utility or diminishing returns. And that's an actual figure from an actual chart that actually shows diminishing returns. This concept sounds pretty simple. The more you have of a thing, the less value each additional thing has than the previous one. You do eventually have an embarrassment of riches. You know, if we talk about water again in the Mojave Desert, wow, one bottle of water, well, having two bottles of water is still great, isn't it? How does that second bottle of water have less value than the first bottle of water? Well, again, it all depends on our situation and what it is that we're measuring. I like to use Oreos as an example. One unit of Oreo, a single cookie, has a certain util value to me. And that first Oreo, for me, is often the best. Now, if I'm feeling quite peckish, I might even decide to have a few more Oreos. But after Oreo five or six, I'm starting to rethink my decision here as to whether snarfing this many Oreos was really the best decision for me. And yes, there is a point at which I will find an Oreo that has negative value. I have eaten so many Oreos that the next Oreo I eat will make me sick. Instead of bringing me any sort of satiation or enjoyment, I am going to heave and feel miserable. Well, how could this happen with money? Well, the amount of money that you have changes the way you look at any other money you get. So if you find a $20 bill on the road, if you only had five bucks in your wallet to begin with, then finding $20 on the street, hey, that's awesome. You're going to bend over and pick that up. Now, if you are Bill Gates or Elon Musk and you find $20 on the street, you're probably not even going to notice walk right past it because you have so much money that another unit added to that is a rounding error. It doesn't matter anymore when you're talking about the degrees of magnitude. And this is good in games. We want things to have diminishing returns so that people are forced to make different decisions. So I designed the Star Wars role play system. You take a lot of damage because we see people getting hit all the time in the movies. Um, so I didn't want people to die in every firefight though. So there are med kits and you can use a med kit to recover four wounds. Sounds pretty simple. Most people have or can suffer between 10 and 16 wounds before they're killed. Well, I wanted people to have the chance to recover, but I didn't want people to overly rely on these med kits and become so reckless or play so against type that it no longer felt like a Star Wars game. So I gave healing diminishing returns. So on any given day in the Star Wars role-playing game, the first med kit that you use recovers four wounds. The second med kit you use recovers three, then two, then one. And a fifth med kit won't recover any wounds. It will have no benefit to you. So 
you have to adjust your way of thinking and understand that, yes, if we get into a scrape early on, that we're going to be okay. It's fine. We've got the med droid packed up with med kits. He's spitting them out left and right. We're going to be okay. Well, now, if we're slogging through firefight after firefight, we might need to conserve resources a little bit more. We might need to rethink our tactics and strategy because we've only got a couple med kits left, and most of us are already pumped full of so much uh, back to that, you know, that next little hit from the med kit isn't going to do that much to help us. So knowing that there are diminished returns as a designer, valuable so that we provide enough options that when option A is no longer available, they move on to option B. Um, you may have seen games where there are no diminishing returns. This often happens in uh, fighting games, Tekken, um, Street Fighter, a lot of those. But I remember in particular Tekken 3 had a character that you could unlock called God, who was a dinosaur, who was just shorter than most people's hit range or hitbox. But his tail was long enough that you could just keep spamming the A button and win every single fight because his tail was longer than your reach and he would hit you and he wouldn't do a lot of damage with each hit, but he was always guaranteed to hit you. And unless you were extremely good and could really, really direct your controls on controllers that did not have such easily fine tuned maneuverability as modern controllers do, then you could spam your way through the entire game with that one character and win. It didn't have diminishing returns, so it became flat. People were able to do the same thing over and over again, and they found no reason to do anything differently because the game didn't teach them that they needed to move off that rock. All right. So those were just a couple little nuggets at the end, dessert from the meal that we had on economics and gaming. I really appreciate everybody's time. Let me go back to the slide that talks about the five points from that. Pull that back up so that you can see what the original five elements were that uh, talked about to begin with. First, I'm going to have to pop out of sharing, obviously, because that's how Zoom and the Mac wants me to play. And fine, I will play it that way. I'm just going to reshare my screen again. So to recap, I believe that games are their own self-contained economies, but they're microcosms, so they do not have all of the nuances that a fully formed, larger scale economy will have. But that's valuable because we could start thinking about some economic elements, such as agency or decision making, is the currency that makes this game flow. That's what we have in our proverbial player wallets to be able to spend over the course of the game to try to win. In order to spend our money though, we need to understand what we're being asked to spend it on. We need to be able to evaluate those. We also need to see how rich everybody else is and understand the value of what they have in front of them, or what they have access to. And we need to have confidence in the system. So games are often really good at creating confidence in the system when it has a pretty pared down and self-contained set of elements. But it's a lot harder when you keep on adding more things. I love Magic the Gathering, been playing uh, since it came out. It came out in my sophomore year of college. I've been playing it ever since. I understand the rules. I can play it very well. But every time there's a new set or series released, it's hard for me to have confidence in the system right away because all hundred of these new cards need to interact with however many hundreds, if not thousands, or tens of thousands of cards there are previously existing in this system. But now there are so many dynamic interactions that it's almost impossible to predict or conceive of what some of these uh, interactions might be. But if you're playing a game of Monopoly, heck, everything that you need is in that box. So you're able to look at all of the components in the box. You're able to look at the entire board. You can leaf through community chest and chance decks, and you can read the rule book, and you can go into a game of Monopoly confident that you, these actions will have these outcomes. Then you just need to uh, listen to your, or draw data from your internal database 
to be able to evaluate and check out how well you're doing, what you want to do next. And because we're purporting, or at least we're going to kind of squint our eyes and say that this is an economy, and hopefully there are enough things here and enough similarities that you could argue, like I just have, that there are enough economic elements here that you could argue a game is an economic microcosm. Well, then we have to start looking at some of these economic truisms that exist, like supply and demand, like utils, like this flexible, a diminishing margin of utility and things like that. And we have to be able to reasonably apply them to some degree, even though, as I said at one point, people make pretty idiotic choices for some really weird and silly reasons. Um, so those are the five main elements of what I talked about today. You'll be able to see the rest of that if you are interested in reviewing the video when it gets posted later. Hopefully I did not go too quickly for people, but I'm going to leave this up for just a little bit longer, but I am done with my portion of the presentation and would love to open it up if anybody has any questions. So again, you can feel free to drop something in the chat. Lexi and I are looking at the chat there. Otherwise, uh, if you have a question, there are few enough of us in here that you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask away if you would like. So if anyone has any questions, comments, or examples that they can use that relate to some of these arguments that I am making. Unless people have wandered away from their screens or I've overwhelmed them with so much information that they're not sure what to think next. This is like my students, where bam, you hit them with so much information that their eyes are starting to glaze over. Now, you all came here for a reason. Hopefully you enjoyed the presentation. Hopefully there was something in there that even if you disagreed with, makes you think about or reevaluate the way that you as a player might make a decision or you as a designer might approach the way you integrate decision-making into your game experience. So I'm gonna give people a couple more minutes to type and add that. Um, I caught the part about diminishing returns and specifically uh, going into some sort of negative returns is something that we've looked at um, in some of the games that I've been designing. And, um, you know, like if there's a negative consequence for continuing to use a certain resource, past its point of its utility, where a player essentially has to be confronted with the decision of, do I keep using this resource because it's the only thing I know how to do? Um, or do I just not use it and save myself that negative consequence? So I'm glad there's a little bit more data behind um, that decision making. Well, what's really interesting with that particular one about having a negative consequence is often that can be paired with the keep away mentality of, I am willing to suffer this negative consequence because I have enough resilience. When I was talking about risk earlier in this presentation, it's like resilient is how well you are able to weather the storm of your decisions. So I might keep on using wood, even though wood is burning a hole in my pocket now, just to prevent you from getting wood because you would get a greater value out of it than I am losing value from it. So for me, that's still a net win so I'm still willing to pay that additional cost, even though it has a, you know, technically a negative cost for me, it still has a positive value, which could be a little bit more of an unusual uh, situation or relationship to look at. Because the value is still, I'm um, keeping Lexi from scoring or using this wood to build whatever they need. Um, from the outside, that may not look very rational, uh, especially to you, who's like, why are you still buying up wood? <laughs> Um, but it still might be the best self-interest preservation move because I know that once you get wood and build up your resources or whatever, then you've got everything else in place that I'm just going to get over with. But I do like having those elements in there because a lot of games have so many decisions to be made that if we don't push people off of their position, if we don't force people to look at it from a different point of view, then they're constantly going to be looking at the same problem from the same perspective, from the same seat. It's like in the classroom, I don't let my students sit in the same seats. 
uh, from class to class. They don't have assigned seating. They have to sit at a different table with different people every class period. So that they're looking at problems literally from a different view. And they're working with other people who are also seeing problems from a different view. So their conversations will be from different perspectives. If we have no further questions, I'm going to stop our recording.